A gust of sand swirls across the ruined arch of Leptis Magna. A boy runs barefoot through the alleys of Gadams, laughter echoing off mud brick walls. In the distance, the sun rises over the Nafusa Mountains, casting a golden veil across a land that remembers everything. History is what we write down, but the truth of a people is what they carry in their blood. For centuries, Libya has been the meeting point of empires. The Phoenicians came first, traders from Tyre, who etched harbors into the coast, and called it Leptis, Sabrathaia. Then the Greeks carved city-states into the Cyrenaic and cliffs. Rome followed, laying down marble and law. And then the Arabs, bearing scripture and tongue, rewrote it all. The Ottomans, the Italians, the British, they came, they claimed, they left. But beneath the scripts of empire, something older endured. The people of Libya didn't vanish when the maps changed. They adapted. They merged. They remembered. We're told that Libyans today are Arab. The census says so. The textbooks agree. But dig deeper into the genome, and you'll find a story that defies categorization. Underneath Arabic dialects, beneath Islamic customs, and behind modern borders lies a complex mosaic of identity, a genetic archive. And in this archive, the names we know, Tripolitania, Cyrenaica, Fezon, mean less than the invisible lines that have always mattered more. The movement of nomads, the flow of maternal clans, the fusion of mountain tribes. Recent genetic studies of Libyan populations don't just trace ancestry. They expose the silence between the lines of history books. The evidence is staggering. Libyans are genetically intermediate between North African Berbers. Mediterranean Europeans, and Middle Eastern populations, but not in the way empire would suggest. They are not conquered peoples. They are the carriers of each civilization's residue. We'll get to the data. EM81, J1, P58, autosomal STR loci. But before the numbers, we must grasp the scale of Libya's forgotten complexity. A nation described in the language of tribes and tongues, yet never truly understood. Because what if Libya's greatest secret isn't written on stone or parchment, but folded deep within its cells? The sun does not rise on a blank slate. It climbs over layers of stone, of language, of ancestry. In Libya, these layers go deeper than most will ever see. When modern science peeled back the skin of North Africa, it uncovered not a single story, but many, stacked, interlaced, and ancient beyond memory. Among these, one lineage stood out like a buried monument, the haplogroup EM81. It is called the Berber marker, but it is more than a genetic label. It is a relic of origin. EM81 pulses strongest in the highlands and deserts, from the Oras Mountains to the windswept ridges of Nafusa. Its frequency among Libyan males tells a silent truth, that long before Islam, before Rome, before even Carthage, there were people here. People whose genetic thread endured every invasion and rewrote itself with time, never erasing its core. This is not a fringe trace. In some regions of Libya, more than one-third of men carry this signature. That is not an echo, it is a presence. And this presence predates the script of history. No records survive from the first Berber tongues. No chronicles from their earliest migrations. But their DNA remained faithful where the memory failed. Who were they? They were not a single tribe or a frozen culture. They were the desert's children, resilient, decentralized, shaped by survival, and bound by language and land rather than by empire. For centuries, they resisted absorption. When Rome paved roads, they took to the mountains. When Arab armies spread across the Maghreb, they absorbed the religion, but not always the rule. And when colonizers redrew borders, the Berber genome refused to vanish. This is the paradox of EM81. It is both deeply rooted and quietly defiant, a signature that refused to be overwritten. Even as Libya's cities adopted foreign architecture and foreign flags, the genome whispered something different. It spoke of a continuity that no empire could erase. And yet, this continuity is not pure. It never was. The ancient Berbers were not untouched. They were participants in trade, conflict, and movement. But their genetic line is not a trace of purity. It is a proof of survival. What does it mean that millions today unknowingly carry the code of a people long obscured by conquest? That within the name Libyan 
lies an origin far older than the nation itself? E. M. 81 doesn't just belong to the past. It is the spine of Libya's present. In the stillness of Libya's desert, language arrived on horseback. The Arab migrations were not a single wave, but a relentless tide, starting in the 7th century and deepening in the 11th with the arrival of Banu Hillel and Banu Sulaim. They carried more than faith. They carried bloodlines. Centuries later, their legacy still pulses in the Libyan genome, most notably in the form of haplogroup J1, P58. This lineage traces back to the Arabian Peninsula, and today, it forms a major component of the male genetic pool across Libya. Its presence is not shallow. It has depth, density, and reach, from Tripoli to Sava, from the coast to the heart of Fezzan. But what is remarkable is not just its prevalence. It is the pattern of coexistence. J1, P58 didn't arrive as a conqueror wiping the slate clean. It layered itself onto the Berber foundation, like new ink on an old scroll. The genome became a palimpsest, a record rewritten, but never erased. In certain regions, this Arab mark rivals or even surpasses the indigenous E, M81. It tells of nomadic lineages that did not just pass through, but took root, mingling through marriage, tribe, and time. The desert, once seen as a barrier, became a bridge. The Arabization of Libya was not merely linguistic. It left fingerprints in the deepest code of its people. But these fingerprints reveal something more complex than domination. They show alliance, assimilation, and transformation. Unlike the brutal rupture seen elsewhere, Libya's genetic landscape speaks of a merger rather than a replacement. The Arab identity did not erase the Berber, it redefined it. Many of today's Libyans bear both lineages within them, unknowingly carrying the history of both mountain and oasis, of camel train and stone fortress. This fusion gave birth to tribes that would define regional power structures for centuries, Warfala, Alat Suleiman, Kadhadfa, tribes whose ancestry maps the genetic convergence of Arabia and North Africa. But genetics doesn't respect ideology. It tells only what is true. And in Libya, truth is layered. So when we speak of Arab Libya, we do not speak of a monolith. We speak of a population shaped by centuries of interweaving, where identity became a negotiation, not a decree. J1, P58 is not just a marker of migration. It is a symbol of how ancestry bends, adapts, and coexists. Not as a single narrative, but as a duet between worlds. To understand Libya is to understand its tribes. Not as relics of the past, but as living structures that shape identity, loyalty, and even genetics to this day. Beneath the flag of a single nation lie more than 20 major tribal groups, some tracing their heritage through the sands of Fezzan, others anchored in the rugged heights of the Nafusa. And within these tribes, generations have preserved fragments of ancestry that science is only now beginning to decode. Recent analyses of autosomal STR loci across regions like the Western Mountains reveal not a uniform population, but a patchwork of micro-ancestries. Genetic variation does not follow modern political lines. It moves along older paths. Kinship, territory, seasonal migration. Some markers point to Mediterranean contacts. Hints of Southern Europe through minor haplogroups like R1b and G2. Others whisper of Eastern routes, from Nile civilizations to the Arabian interior. These aren't statistical anomalies. They're signatures of Libya's long-standing role in the great human dialogue across three continents. But perhaps the most striking aspect is the genetic separation hidden within proximity. A village a hundred kilometers from another may share language and religion, yet reflect an entirely different ancestral profile. Such distances are not measured in miles, but in tribal memory. Among the Bedouin of Surti and the Tuareg of the South, the genome reflects isolation shaped by mobility. These are not contradictions. They are patterns born of harsh terrain, where survival demanded both movement and exclusivity. In the highland Berbers, particularly around the Nafusa range, allele frequencies reveal a different genetic rhythm, one shaped by centuries of endogamy and resistance to outside influence. Meanwhile, coastal populations like Misrata or Tripoli have absorbed a wider spectrum, a result of trade, colonization, and urban migration. It's not a melting pot. It's a mosaic, each tile representing a unique inheritance. Even within the same tribal name, 
regional variations exist. The Aulat Suleiman of the north are not genetically identical to their cousins, who once pushed into the Lake Chad Basin. These distinctions persist because Libya's tribal fabric, though often romanticized or politicized, is grounded in real genetic divergence. Genetics, in this context, becomes a cartography of belonging. It maps unspoken histories. Who married whom? Who stayed? Who fled? And who returned? And in that silent cartography lies a question we seldom ask. How many histories do we carry, without ever knowing they're not the same? Tucked into the shadows of history is a story few remember, of a people who once walked the alleys of Tripoli, tended shops in Benghazi, whispered prayers in ancient tongues, and then vanished. For nearly 2,000 years, Libyan Jews lived at the crossroads of empire, faith, and geography. But while their neighbors shifted with the tides of conquest, they remained genetically distinct, almost untouched by the very currents that shaped the rest of the nation. Modern genetic analysis confirms what tradition long suspected. This was no ordinary diaspora fragment. Libyan Jews form a cluster of their own, separate not only from local Muslim populations, but even from other Jewish communities across North Africa and the Middle East. 19 out of 20 individuals tested fell into a singular genomic grouping. No other Jewish population revealed such isolation. Not the Yemenites, not the Moroccans, not even the Ashkenazim of Europe. This uniqueness cannot be explained by religion alone. It is the fingerprint of centuries spent in semi-seclusion, of intermarriage within the community, of ancient bottlenecks followed by slow, internal growth. Unlike their North African counterparts in Morocco or Algeria, who absorbed large waves of Iberian Jews after the 1492 expulsion, Libyan Jews saw few newcomers. They remained anchored to their ancestral cities, their traditions preserved behind quiet walls. Yet their genome tells more than a tale of isolation. It also hints at ancient synthesis. Embedded within their code are fragments that likely originate from local Berber groups. Proof of a forgotten time when cultural boundaries were porous, and conversion or coexistence left lasting traces and bloodlines. But this community's timeline is marked by rupture. Pogroms, colonial tension, and geopolitical turmoil led to a rapid exodus in the mid-20th century. Most Libyan Jews departed between 1949 and 1951, leaving behind synagogues, cemeteries, and an echo that still resonates in empty courtyards. Today, there are no Jews in Libya. Not a single practicing family remains. The last known member passed away in 2002, closing a chapter that had survived Roman oppression, Arab conquest, Ottoman rule, and European colonization. And yet, their DNA remains, a time capsule sealed in the descendants now scattered across Israel, Italy, and beyond. What does it mean when a population disappears from the land, but not from the record of human inheritance? Their stones may crumble, their names may fade, but within strands of nucleotides, their presence endures, quiet, invisible, undeniable. The Libyan Jews did not vanish. They transformed into a hidden island in the sea of human ancestry. There are eras in a nation's life when the future drowns out the past. For Libya, that era began not with conquest, but with crude oil. With the rise of petroleum wealth in the 20th century, came cities reshaped by steel and cement. Foreign workers poured in Egyptians, Tunisians, Sudanese, Chadians, Yugoslavians. They came to build, to teach, to heal. And as they arrived, so did their genes. The Libyan genome, once shaped by centuries of regional migration and tribal lineage, began to change again. But now under the forces of labor, economics, and global politics. Autosomal DNA analysis from the late 20th century captures a subtle shift, new genetic signals appearing alongside the ancient ones. They are faint but real. They speak of guest workers who stayed, of intermarriages that followed function rather than tradition. But even as this new diversity entered, something else remained striking. The foundational markers, EM81, J1, P58, and others, held their ground. Despite globalization, Despite the rise and fall of Gaddafi's regime, the oldest components of Libya's genetic code stayed resilient, as if the land itself insists on continuity, even while the surface burns. And burn it did.
the collapse of the Jamahiriya in 2011 didn't just fracture government. It shattered institutions that once held demographic data together. Civil war scattered communities, displaced families, and forced millions to flee or hide. In the chaos, record-keeping faltered. Census figures blurred. But population genetics, silent and objective, continued to tell the truth. One might expect that such political upheaval would distort the genetic landscape beyond recognition. But the data says otherwise. What emerged from the instability wasn't erasure, but entrenchment. Conflict hardened boundaries. People returned to tribal networks for survival. Intergroup mixing declined. Ironically, war preserved certain ancestral identities more firmly than peace ever did. Even birth rates reflect this reversal. Under the central planning of the oil state, fertility declined, urbanization rose. But with instability came a rebound, an increase in population numbers likely tied to early marriage and lack of infrastructure. These shifts echo within the gene pool, altering its rhythm, if not its roots. This is the paradox of Libya in the modern age. Progress brought mixture, collapse restored division. Yet through it all, the deepest patterns endured, not because they were static, but because they had been forged across millennia of adaptation. DNA became the one institution that didn't fall. In the laboratories that study Libyan genomes today, the samples speak without bias. They carry no flag, no ideology, only information, a chronicle written not in ink, but in code. And from that code, one truth becomes impossible to ignore. Even in the age of pipelines and politics, Identity remains more ancient than any regime. What does it mean to inherit a story you cannot read? In Libya, identity is not a matter of declaration. It is a landscape, layered, scarred, fertile, and unresolved. For every name on a family tree, there are hundreds of unnamed ancestors buried not in graveyards, but in chromosomes. A nation born of movement, of collision, of stillness in the face of sandstorms. And beneath it all, a genetic script written before the first word was ever carved into stone. There is no single origin here. No pure lineage. Only the persistence of memory across generations of silence. The Berber mountain blood. The Arab desert pulse. The Jewish fragment preserved in exile. The southern migration echoing from the Sahel. The Roman whisper barely audible in a haplogroup. The mother from the east. The father from the coast. Together. They form what no empire could unify and no war could divide. The Libyan genome. It does not shout. It does not argue. It simply endures, quiet, precise, and honest. And in that silence lies a question for all of us. How much of your identity is the story you were told? And how much is the legacy you carry without knowing? We live in an age where DNA can resurrect forgotten lives. It can challenge myths. It can confirm legends. It can heal divides or expose them. So tell us, what surprised you the most about Libya's genetic history? What part of your own ancestry feels mysterious, incomplete, or misunderstood? Let's begin a conversation that goes beyond the headlines. Because in the end, our genomes are not just maps of where we come from. They're invitations to remember, to rediscover, to reconnect. If this journey stirred something in you, share it. Subscribe for more stories written not by kings or scribes, but by the cells that make us human. And remember, sometimes the oldest truths are the ones we're only just beginning to hear.